and we can start recording anytime. On the back, you have the sheet that's for today, um, and we've got your key verse there, uh, and then you've got a first, and then uh, you've got some places there uh, if you want to fill in some of the, if you want to fill in some blanks as we go. I've learned a lesson. Do you remember when we first start, started our study of Acts? I had blanks all over the place, and people were terrified. It's like, what, what goes in this blank? What goes in this blank? And as you can see, I've learned and I have very few blanks these days, right? Just a few key blanks. So we can all fill them in. We'll be fine. You can ask any questions you want to afterwards. And there's some of you that asked for books. Lerma and Alice, I've got them for you upstairs. Remind me after the service. So these are our, uh, this is our study guide. Wait, just, there we go. Okay, so we turn again to the word of the Lord this morning and we come to the end of this section. As I was preparing, I started early this week, and I'll, I'll be honest with you, I kind of struggled as I was preparing for this because it hit me as I was preparing. <gasps> it's Palm Sunday, and you know at Lighthouse we are not particularly liturgical. We don't strongly follow a church calendar, but it really hit me. It's like, well, this is, this is, this is Palm Sunday. But as I was preparing, the Holy Spirit really spoke to my heart and encouraged me that this is actually a perfect passage to look at for Palm Sunday. Because what did we say when Pastor Renee was talking to us, uh, when Pastor Renee w was waving the palm branches? What did the people say? They said, Hosanna. And then they said, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And the beautiful picture we have here is of Philip coming in the name of the Lord. As Jesus came, he came bringing good news. It was good news of deliverance. It was good news of salvation. It was good news of healing. It was good news. And he was coming in the power of the Lord, the name of the Lord. And that's how Philip comes as well, as we're going to, as we saw last week, and as we're going to see this morning as well. And so as we look at this, so Philip goes to this city in Samaria and we remember what Acts 1-8 says in fulfillment of the promise. The next slide, Acts 1-8, we all know this, we, we all have this memorized if we haven't before now, right? We're referring to this one often. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. There's no way to be a witness for the Lord Jesus Christ. And witness is not just what we say, but it's who we are and it's how we live and it's what we do. Can't do it. Can't do it without the power of the Holy Spirit. Can't do it. I can't do it. You can't do it. But the Lord Jesus Christ promised I will send the, fa the Father and I will send the Holy Spirit. And God the Spirit came that we might be his witnesses. That and many other things as well. God the Spirit came that we might be free and delivered and healed. All of these. It's all part of the work of the Holy Spirit. So last week we talked about saints, sinners. We talked a little bit about a sorcerer. And we're going to talk more about the sorcerer today. But we're going to talk a little bit more about power today as well. In a way that's not spooky uh, or weird or creepy or whatever, but in a way that will encourage us as we look at what happens when Simon the Sorcerer, a man of miracles and signs and power, meets Philip, a man of miracles and signs and powers. Amen? This is what we see here. So Philip comes to this city and very simply we're going to see that he does two things. Let's look at the next passage. So I want you to look with me. I have included here, if you'll see in the brackets, I've included some other parts of translations. Philip goes to the city in Samaria. He proclaims the Christ there, and that means the message of good news concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ. The crowds hear him, and they saw the signs and great miracles he did. They all paid close attention to what he said. With shrieks, evil spirits came out of many, and many paralytics and cripples were healed. So there was great joy in the city. You think if this happened in your home city, in your hometown, there would be great joy in the city? Sure. You all are sitting there like, that's a trick question. It's not a trick question. There would be. There would be. And so Philip comes as Jesus came in the power of the Spirit, and he's preaching the Christ. Now look with me, and this is in your, you got a blank on your pages there, so you've got two things. I've given you a question in the handout. What two things do we see Philip doing? 
Okay, look at the scriptures, look at these, pas these passages, and you can put it very, very simply. You can actually, you can put it in just a few words. What are the two things that, did I said, did I say Peter? If I said Peter, I meant Philip. In fact, if I say Peter, I mean Philip. Um, what are the two things that we see Philip do? Look at it. Okay. Okay, so I heard somebody say now, so you may have said something different. The first word I heard was he proclaimed. So he proclaimed the Christ. So let's start with that one. So Philip comes, he proclaims, he preaches, he speaks. Okay, and we know that he's coming in, he comes in the power of the Spirit. So very simply, Peter, uh, Philip, <laughs> Philip preaches, he proclaims. It's a message. It's a good message. It's good news. Brothers and sisters, the message of Jesus, wherever it goes forth, is good news for all who will accept it, for all who will receive it, for all who will open their hearts. Wherever it is, not just in Samaria, in Hong Kong, in our hometowns, wherever it is. So he proclaims. What is the other thing that Philip does? Okay. He works, he does miracles and signs. So there's signs and miracles. So two things, very, very simply. He speaks or he preaches and he performs. But performs is kind of a bad word because that makes it sound like he's acting in a way. And it's not that, but he speaks and he does, right? Two things. Now, I want us to see something as we look at this. Philip cannot do these things in his own power. He does it in the power of the Spirit. This is the Spirit's realm. This is the Spirit's work. Philip could have preached from sunup to sundown. He could have gone from city to city, town to town for weeks, and nothing would have happened if the Holy Spirit, God, had not been with him, if he had not filled him with power. Brothers and sisters, you and I can do nothing of value for God, nothing of spiritual effect in God unless it is in the power of the Holy Spirit. We cannot. We cannot. Our best efforts, our highest work, our greatest deeds, all of these things, if it's in our own power, it does nothing. It does nothing. Why? Because there's another power at work against us. Let me tell you something, brothers and sisters, this morning. You don't have to be afraid. You don't have to be <gasps> scared or this or that. But there is a power. If you are a child of God this morning, there's a power that's opposed to you. There's a power that's opposed to anything that you would do for God and in God. There's a power that stands against. That's why we must have the Holy Spirit with us, in us, filling us, empowering us, leading us, guiding us, showing us what to do because His is a greater power and the power of the Holy Spirit in Jesus Christ has already defeated and overcome any power of the enemy. That's what we are looking at and celebrating and remembering as we come to Good Friday on this Friday. As we look again uh, on Easter Sunday or Resurrection Sunday, the enemy is a defeated foe. He is a defeated power, but we must be in him and we must be full of him. And so Philip comes into this city of Samaria. Note, remember with me, the city, this city of Samaria is a religious city. It is a religious city. They've got religion. They've got all, they've got temples. They've got this and that. They've got a temple to God in that city, but it's all mixed up. The religion is mixed up with pagan religion. It's all there. So they've, they've got this religious background, but they have not yet heard the true, full, spirit-filled message that Jesus has come and set people free. But Philip comes. Philip comes. And what does he do? He preaches. He spreads the word. He spreads the word. I would like to judge these Christians right here. It took five years, approximately. It took five years from the time that Jesus said to his disciples, but you will receive power after the Holy Ghost comes upon you and you will be my witnesses here, here, and here, Samaria, and then so on. And I think, five years? You're kidding me. It took five years for them to tell other people the good news of Jesus Christ, that people who had been hounded and in bondage to demons, 
demons. You don't, you don't think that was miserable? You don't think that was miserable? That bondage, it took five years for somebody to come and tell them, you can be free. You can be free. I want to judge them. But then I remember how long it has sometimes taken me and you to go beyond our doorstep and share with our neighbors the good news of Jesus Christ and that he has come to set them free and that there's, there's deliverance in him. Is that true or is that true? That's true. That's true. But Philip comes. But Philip comes and he preaches. And people respond and they, he's spreading the word, but he's not. So people begin to respond. But then one of those who's also responding, who else responds? Okay, we talked about him last week. Simon responds as well, the sorcerer. And I want you to see something with, with me this morning as we, as we think about Simon, because we talked about this last week. He claims that he's someone great. Uh, he's amazing the people of Samaria. And I believe me, he's not just amazing the people with some card tricks. Have you ever been amazed by a card trick? How'd you do that? Yeah? You know, you see something or whatever and they pull an egg, as I use the example, an egg out of somebody's ear. How did that happen? And we're amazed, right? Simon is doing something more than switching cards around and pulling eggs out of people's ears. Of course, it's not out of people's ears. You know what I mean. He's doing something that is beyond the natural. It's something that's supernatural, right? We know that it's supernatural because of what we see comes next. Everyone from the least to the greatest spoke of him often as the great one, the power of God. They listened closely to him because for a long time he had astounded them with his magic. The people think this power comes from God. This power is God. Now, think with me all the way back, all the way back. Before Satan was Satan, what was his name before it was Satan? Lucifer. Where was Lucifer before he was cast down? Heaven. What did Lucifer do before he's doing what he does now? He was the worship leader of heaven. He was the worship leader of heaven. He led the worship of God. Do you remember what Lucifer said? I will become like God. I will be like the Most High. I will. And Lucifer took for himself. Lucifer wanted, coveted, and took for himself the worship and the position that is God, that was God's alone. And because of that, he was cast out of heaven and he fell. The enemy still does the same thing today. He wishes to take for himself what is God's alone. He wishes for himself praise and honor and all of these things that should be ascribed to, God's al to God alone. He still goes after people, men, women, and children who were made in the image of God, who have been bought with the blood of Jesus Christ, and he goes after those who are created in God's image and objects of his love for himself, for himself, for himself. And if he can't have them, he wants to destroy what he can't have. The enemy has not changed what he does. We saw it, we see it in the beginning. Do we see that? Do we see it here? We see it here. And he hasn't changed now. He hasn't changed now. And so we see that Simon takes this place. He's operating in power. People say, oh, ooh, oh, look, it's the power of God. He's the great one. Is he the great one? Is he the power of God? He's not, is he? It's the power of the enemy. It's the power of the devil. And the devil has not changed even today. But then along comes Philip. Along comes Philip in the power of God, in the power of God, full of the Spirit, full of the Spirit. 
This is why, brothers and sisters, if you're afraid, if you've been afraid of the devil, if you've been, and I'm not trying to make light of it. Is there power there? Yes, there's power there. I'm not trying to make light. And I, it's nothing to make light of, but, what, but I do want us to see this today in this encounter with, with Simon and with Philip and with God and all of this. I want us to see that we need not fear the enemy and his power, for we are children of a great God. We are children who are full of the Holy Spirit, God himself. Not just the power of God available to us, but God himself, God the Spirit who lives in us. And that is why we submit ourselves to him. That is why we say, oh Lord, you are God of my life. That is why one of the practices of my life as a pastor, as a pastor, one of the practices of my life every morning, every morning in, in recent years, God, I submit myself to you on the way to church this morning as I was driving that beautiful red Volkswagen that Robert and Hazel blessed me with a few years ago. As I was driving that, that beautiful bright red Volkswagen to church, that was one of my prayers. That was one of my prayers. Lord, I submit myself to you this day. You are Lord of my life. You have control over my tongue. You have control over my heart, over my attitude. All of these things, all of these things. Because you see, when we're under the hand of God, remember in the teaching that we had before about humbling ourselves under God? What has to happen? The devil has to flee. The devil has to flee. He's got to go. He has no place in your life. He has no authority over you. He can't touch you. And so you don't have to be afraid. And so we see this with Philip as he comes in. He's preaching the gospel, accompanied by confirming powers of signs and miracles through the mighty God, the Holy Spirit. People are healed and delivered and they respond with great joy. Now I want us to see something and it's on your page if, if you want to take notes as well. I think I, 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 I say something there about it. And what I tell you on the, on your, on, what I say is here. Um... Simon operated in power and amazed people for many years, but consider what power that does not come from God does. Power that does not come from God attempts to deceive and then bring into bondage. Always, always, always. If you, and you say, oh yes, you know those non-Christians out there that are under the control of the devil. Listen, it's not only those that are outside of God's family. I have seen Christians who are under this same attack, under this same work, under this same bondage. When you and I don't have the Word of God filling our lives and believing the Word of God, we start to listen to the lies of the enemy and we are deceived by the lies of the enemy, are we not? You're this, you're this, you're this. Sometimes when the enemy attacks me that way, you say, ooh, Pastor Jennifer, he attacks you that way, but you're the pastor. Is something wrong? No. But the enemy attacks. The Bible's very clear about that. How do I fight? How do I stand? How do you fight? How do you stand? We stand on the Word of God. We stand in the power of the Holy Spirit. That is how we overcome. That is how we are not deceived. That is how we do not get taken into bondage. Anytime there's power that's operating that does not come from God, it attempts to deceive you and it attempts to bring you into bondage. Let me give you an example. Let me give you an example. Years ago, you know that I was teaching, uh, you knew I taught in China, I was teaching at Beijing University, and our students began to respond uh, to the Lord, especially a group of, uh, they were all good friends, um, but a group of, of uh, uh, young, girl, young uh, female students began to respond uh, to us. And they were in our classes, they were in our oral English classes and our literature classes when Sister Betty and I were there at the university. And they began to open their hearts. They were searching anyhow, and they began to open their hearts to the Lord. And it was so encouraging just, just to begin to see them. They were hungry and they were seeking. And they began to, some of them began to become Christians. But there was one young student, one who was part of the group, that as she opened her heart, instead of going towards Jesus, she went in a different direction. And, um, and I could see that something else was going on. I thought, what is going on? And one day in class, I was teaching an extended class, and I gave the students a break. And I looked back, and as the other students were taking a break, she sat, she was sitting there, and all I can tell you was her face just looked dark. 
It looked dark and it looked heavy. I, I don't know any other way to, to, to put it. Just literally, it was just like, it was just like there was a, a darkness on her face and I'm not talking about, I'm not talking about skin color. It was something, there was just darkness on her face. And then as she sat there, she just put her head down like this and she, she just did this. And so I, I was concerned and so I walked back and I called her name and she looked up and I thought, oh. And I said, are you okay? Is something wrong? And she said, I, I just, I, it's so hard, it's so heavy. I just, and I thought, well, does she have a headache? What is it? But I felt like it was more. And as she began to talk, she began to tell me about one of the other classes she was taking at the university. And the class that she was taking was a special research class. I, I couldn't believe it when I heard it. It was a special research class into Qigong, okay? Um, and some of you are saying Qigong, uh, they told me in the first, in the first, service what qigong is in Cantonese. What is it in Cantonese? Hey, hey something, right? Hei gong. Okay, hei gong. If you look up qigong in any dictionary, it will tell you it is a system of breathing. <laughs> Did you know that? Look it up in the dictionary. A system of breathing and meditation to help with exercise. So innocuous, so benign, so, oh, well, it's this great whatever. Now, now listen. If you come from an ethnic Chinese background, I'm not talking, I'm not knocking or criticizing Chinese culture. I'm not. I'm just giving you giving you this example. But what and and it the what they say is it it you uh, harness the you harness power you harness this life force, is it life force if you will, and you you control it and you can do things with it and it helps you with breathing helps you with exercise, helps all sorts of things. When she told me that, I looked at her, I called her by the name, and I said, stay away from that. Stay away from that. It's not good. It won't help you. It won't. And I just went down the line, don't do it. And I was horrified that this, one of the top universities in the country would have a research class into Qigong. They brought in a Qigong master to do all of this. And I don't want to go too long with the story. But it went on, time went on, and she continued down that road and she came I met her one day I was walking on the campus and she was walking by and she started to talk to me continuing to talk with me and the, the Holy Spirit brought this to mind as I was preparing this message she reminded he reminded me of this young of this young student that I had because here are her words as she talked with me about a month later she said oh she said, but you know teacher she said you know there's power there I looked at her, I said, mm-hmm. And she said, but sometimes, and we're learning to, <clears throat> here's the lie, right? And we're learning to control the power, right? We're learning to control the power. She said, but teacher, sometimes I feel like it's trying to control me. And I said, yep, that's right. And that is a perfect example of what we're talking about here. Any power that is not of God, in the end, it may look good, it may feel good initially. It may seem to do good things in your life or in another person's life. But if it is not of God, it will deceive you and it will bring you into bondage. It will bring you into bondage. But hallelujah, there's another greater power that has come. And Jesus talks about that. What does Jesus say? Look at the next passage, Luke 4. Look with me, because we're talking about power, and we're talking about what Jesus has come to do. Jesus returned to Galilee, how? In the power of the Spirit. You say, well, of course, Pastor Jennifer, in the power of the Spirit, because he was God the Son. No! He did not use his divinity as God the Son. He was Jesus. Jesus is the human name. Jesus is his human name. He relied not on his own ability. He relied not on, oh, well, I'm the son of God. He relied on the power of the Spirit. God the Holy Spirit. 
Why is this so important for us, brothers and sisters? Because Jesus showed us how we too will live in this world. Jesus showed us how we too must overcome in this world. Jesus showed us how the power of the enemy will be defeated in our lives and in the lives of those to whom we preach the good news. That's the only way there's deliverance. That's the only way there's freedom. That's the only way salvation will come. What did Jesus say? But when he comes, the Holy Spirit, he will convict the world. I can't do it. You can't do it. With all my wise words, with all of my, all of my degrees in English and this and that, all the words that I could use will convince no heart, will convict no heart. But when he comes, the Spirit, he will convict. He will convict. And Jesus came, how? In the power of the Spirit. He stands, he takes the scroll of the prophet Isaiah. He had been fasting for 40 days in the wilderness. What was happening during those 40 days? His flesh was getting weak. His self, his self was getting weak. The, the human part of him was weakened. He was humbling himself under God's mighty hand. And he was growing mighty in spirit. And it says... The he returned in the power of the Spirit, and then, look with me. Oh, be encouraged this morning, brothers and sisters. Look with me at what Jesus reads about himself. Verse 18, the Spirit of the Lord is on me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The Spirit of the Lord is on me as the Spirit of the Lord is on us as we come to him. The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me. This is the power of the Holy Spirit. He's anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the captives and recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And then he says, today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Hey, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. There is a power. It is a great power. It is the power of God. It is God the Spirit. And God the Spirit, when he comes, what did Jesus say? He will lead you into what? All truth. He will lead you into all truth. God the Spirit working in power will lead you into all truth. He's not going to lead you into deception. You can trust him. You can ask for the Holy Spirit's help. You can go to the Word of God. In fact, I urge you, when you open the Word, when you open God's Word, just say, Holy Spirit, speak to me. Holy Spirit, help me understand these living words. Holy Spirit, bring these words alive in my life and in my heart. Open my spiritual understanding. Breathe into me this day. That's what God, the Holy Spirit, does. He brings us, He leads us into all truth. And he sets us free from every bondage, from every bondage. This is what Jesus has come to do. And Philip, I'll say amen. I'm pretty happy about that. I'm pretty excited about that. Jesus said, today this is, this, this is fulfilled in your hearing. It is what he has done in your life and in my life. Andrew is sitting here. Brother Andrew, Andrew Chan, is sitting here this morning. I love to use him as an example. I hope you don't mind. And I look at him and I see someone in, that Jesus has set free from the power of heroin. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. And there are other powers and there are other bondages as well because there are internal bondages. There are other things that are not a drug or this or that. But he sets us free from every bondage. It may be a bondage of thought. It may be a bondage of memories. It may be a bondage of unforgiveness or jealousy or this or that. He has come to set us free. And his power is great. And he is able to deliver us from every bondage of the enemy. This is why he has come. And this is the message that Philip preaches. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. And so here's this Simon operating in power, seeming to do good to people, but actually doing what? Deceiving and bringing into greater bondage. Yes? Yes. Then Philip comes in the power of the Spirit, a great power from God that is the truth, leads people into truth, and brings true, true deliverance. Amen? 
just as we have been delivered. And so what happens? Let's look at the next one. They believed Philip's message. What should happen when we believe the message of good news? What should happen? You, we should be baptized, okay? That's the external step of obedience to what has happened internally, internally. So they believed the message and they were baptized. And not only they believe, the crowds, but Simon himself believes and he's baptized. And so we see this. And I want to pause on that for just a minute, camp on this for just a minute, because on May 1st, we're going to have a water baptism at Stanley. Now, I'm not sure why we're going to Stanley, because that's a little bit tough, but that's okay. The important thing is we're going to have a water baptism, okay? We're going to have a water baptism. So my question is, have you believed? Yes. Having believed, have you been baptized in water? That's my question. Having believed, have you been baptized in water? If you have not yet been baptized in water, since believing, you should be baptized in water. You say, now, Pastor Jennifer, you're meddling now. Just preach the word. I'm preaching the word. <laughs> This is not what Pastor Jennifer said. This is what God said. This is the example that God gives us. And so they believe and they're baptized. Now, here comes the head scratcher verse. We talked about this, verse 13. Simon believed and was baptized. Pause right there. Pause right there, just a minute. I want to remind you of something. Remember when Jesus gave the parable of the sower or the farmer who went out to sow. That's included in all four Gospels, and there's a reason for it. And Jesus said, if you don't understand this parable, how can you understand anything else that I'm teaching? How can you understand? And it talks about, it, we all know the parable of the, of the sower or the parable of the farmer spreading the seed, because it is, at its heart, it's just the message of the Gospel being preached and how people respond. It's, it has to do with the seed going forth and people's hearts as they respond to the seed of the gospel. And so we see here Philip throwing out the seed of the word and people responding, their hearts responding, and included in that response is Simon the sorcerer. But now before you say, well, did he believe or did he not? Well, what's going on here? You go back and think about the parable of the sower, the parable of the farmer, and how the seed sprang up and how hearts responded, okay? Let me ask you something. Have you ever seen somebody at Lighthouse maybe? Don't name any names. Or in your own experience, someone that has seemed to respond, but time proved that it was not a genuine conversion or a genuine belief. Yes? Yes. All of us had. Have. Jesus himself said it would be this way. It would be this way. The key is this, it doesn't have to be true of us. It doesn't have to be true of you. It doesn't have to be true of me. You know what I hold on to? But some seed fell on good soil and produced 30, 60, and my favorite, a hundredfold. I want to, to have soil in my heart that produces a hundredfold, don't you? A hundredfold, a hundredfold. But this is how it is. And so we see this. And so Simon believes, and he follows Philip wherever he goes. Now look with me, and this will help us. What is amazing to Simon? Is Simon amazed by, oh, thank you, Jesus, you set us free. Hallelujah. Is that what amazes Simon? What amazes Simon? Thank you. Signs and miracles and the things. So that's a key for us, and that's what we see. So he believes, and he follows Philip everywhere. Now, back in Jerusalem, the apostles hear, there's a revival in Samaria. There's a revival in Samaria. Let's go. And they send Peter and John. And remember, we ended with, these, we, we ended with this last time, and we were so glad it was Peter and John because Peter was definitely one who was the most religious and self-righteous of, of, of the 12. And John was the one who had said, Master, do you want us to call down fire from heaven and burn these Samaritans up? So I think, I think it's pretty funny that the Holy Spirit says, <clears throat> send Peter and John because it was certainly the Holy Spirit. Now let's see what happens next in this beautiful picture of harmony and unity and breaking down barriers and walls. What do we see? Peter and John go. 
They go down to Samaria. They pray for them to receive the Holy Spirit. They lay hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. You say, well, how did it happen? Well, who this and what were the signs? The Bible doesn't tell us. But what we know is this. They received the Holy Spirit. They received the Holy Spirit. And what should be key to us this morning? They were not second-class Christians. They were given the same beautiful gift of the Holy Spirit that they themselves had received in a sign of harmony and unity. God has no second-class children, brothers and sisters. God doesn't play favorites with people. God responds to everyone who comes to Him. His gifts are for everyone who will come to Him in response and in truth and in faith with open hearts. And they received the same Holy Spirit that they themselves, that Peter and John had received five years earlier. Same Holy Spirit. Same Holy Spirit. Five years earlier. Peter and John laid hands on them. Uh oh Why did Peter and John lay hands on them? I don't know. You say, well, I know. No, you don't. We have some ideas. We don't know exactly. All we can guess is the Holy Spirit probably told them. I, I think the Holy Spirit told them to do it. Um, you say, well, is that the pattern? So to receive the Holy Spirit, the leaders have to lay hands on me and pray for me? I, I don't think so. Why? Two chapters later, Peter's going to be preaching a sermon. A sermon. He has not even given an altar call. He has not even said, raise your hands if you want to receive Jesus. He will not have led anybody in the sinner's prayer. And what's going to happen while he's preaching? The Holy Spirit is going to be given to a whole bunch of Gentiles. Gentiles. Not even half Jew, half Gentile. Gentiles. God, the Spirit, is in charge of what happens in His church. God the Spirit. God the Spirit. And they receive the same Spirit. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. This is the answer. This is the fulfilling of the promise and the prophecy that Joel gave. He says, your sons and your daughters, that beautiful prophecy. And he says, this is for your children, your children's children, for all those who are far off. And remember what Peter preaches on the day of Pentecost? This is for you, for your children, for your children's children, and for all who are far off. Guess what? G got your attention then, didn't I? Jennifer, I, I did. You're paying attention now. Jennifer Nolan is in that verse. I'm a far off. I'm a far off. But he answered that promise and he fulfilled that promise in my life. You are a far off. But he fulfills the same promise in your life and in my life as well. Amen? Amen. Amen. This is what he does. It's not a church thing. It's not a denomination thing. It's a God thing. It's a God thing. It's a God thing. And so the Holy Spirit is given. <sighs> Let's go back to our buddy. He's not our buddy. Let's go back to Simon because he's still there. He's been following Philip around and then... He sees what happens when Peter and John lay hands and pray. And what does he say? Well, first of all, he probably says, wow. Okay. And then he says, give me this power too, so that anyone I lay hands on may receive the Holy Spirit. He is amazed. He's intrigued. Why is he so amazed and intrigued by this? I was thinking about it. Let me ask you something. Is there an area in which you are expert or extremely knowledgeable? Probably. And then somebody comes along and with their expertise or knowledge or ability in your same area, they just sort of blow you out of the water with their skill and their ability. We've all maybe seen that or heard that in some way, right? And you just go, <gasps> Simon understood power and its effects. This is what he dealt with. This is what he had been part of for many, many, many years. And he sees it and he recognizes it. Please don't take this the wrong way. But in Simon's mind, he sees, here are two sorcerers who are more powerful than I am. I, I, 
you're not offended, are you? But that's, that's Simon's thinking. It, it really is. That's Simon's thinking. And so he says, oh, hey, we're in the same business, like lawyers together. Or you know what I mean. Or insurance agents together. Or, or, or something like that. But basically, hey, we're in the same business together. I'll give you some money. Give me this trick. Give me this power. It's true. It's true. That's what is going on there. That's what is going on there. And to me, that shows us what was in his heart, doesn't it? It really shows us what was in his heart. Now, what is Peter's response at this point? It's not gentle. and <laughs> It's not soft. Basically, Peter pronounces a curse upon Simon because he is cursed because of what's in his heart. Look at it with me. What does it say? It says... It says, when, uh, it says, may your silver be destroyed with you. One translation says, uh, and I won't say it anyhow, but in other words, this is, you are damned because of this. That's, that, that's what it means because of what's in his heart and because money will, not, is, is, will never go to heaven in that sense. May it be destroyed with you because you thought the gift of God could be obtained with money. You have no part no share, because your heart is not right before God. Therefore, repent of this wickedness of yours and pray to the Lord that the intent of your heart may be forgiven you. For I see you are poisoned by bitterness and bound by iniquity, captive by sin. Captive by sin. Whoa! Wait a minute, Peter. Simon's a baby Christian. He, he, he doesn't know very much yet. He hasn't yet taken the you are welcome class. He needs to take foundations one and foundations two. Then he won't, he, he won't think this way anymore. That is not what Peter does. Peter is given discernment and insight into the heart of Simon. And it's not just, oh, you're thinking the wrong way. Peter sees that this is the work of the enemy. Because you see, if Simon could have this power and do this, everybody would still think, oh, look, it's the power of God. And the work of, en of the enemy would come right alongside the work of God and corrupt the pure, wonderful, saving work that God was doing among the Samaritans. I want to say something to you. Don't be discouraged and don't be afraid. But as you are working for the Lord, this is the work of the enemy. And whenever God begins to work, I want to tell you right now, the enemy will come right along beside. He'll stop it if he can. But if he cannot, he will come right along beside and try to get in on it like, see, I'm part of this too. Do you understand? The Holy Spirit is not deceived because he's not the spirit of truth. And so we're full of the Holy Spirit and he helps us to discern and he helps to protect his church. That's what he does. Amen? Amen. So Peter doesn't mess around and he says, I see your heart. You're poisoned by bitterness. You're bound by iniquity. We're looking at someone that I think was never truly saved, didn't really have saving faith. But I want to say something to you this morning. I believe that Christians can f be led this down this way as well. I really do. Because when we choose to believe things that are not true, when we hold on to things in our lives that we know are not pleasing to the Lord, when we continue to take part in things that, that we know, God, I, I shouldn't be, but it's still part of our lives. I'm not being legalistic this morning. The Holy Spirit can speak to you. I'm not saying that you follow a list of things that Pastor Jennifer and Pastor Renee say you shouldn't do this and you shouldn't do this. I'm not saying that. But if your heart is open to the Holy Spirit, He will tell you and He will lead you into what you should be doing and what you shouldn't be doing. Holy Spirit does that. Holy Spirit does that. And what I want to say to you is this. If you will listen to the Holy Spirit and obey the Holy Spirit, He will keep you from this. But if we stubbornly choose to go our own way, to do our own thing, to go this way, to allow bitter jealousy to poison our hearts, we will, we will be bound. We will become captive to sin. 
I've seen it in many, many Christians. I have seen it in my own life at times, in, in my earlier life. And I, deter I have determined quite a long time ago that that's not going to be in my life. I've told the Lord and I've told the devil, God, my life is for you. Work on these things. Satan, you're not going to have room to work in my life. God's the Lord of my life and he's going to work on me. And he'll work on you too. This is for everybody. This is for everybody. Now don't get discouraged because your pastor just told you that. We're all people together. And God works with each one of us in the same way. And so we come right near the end. How does Simon respond to this? And let's look at what, what, how Simon responds. And this will help us as well. Next passage. Um, Simon says, Oh! I, I'm putting my own dramatic whatever on it, but you understand, right? Simon says, Oh! Oh, gang, uh. <laughs> Really, that's what Simon does. He says, Please pray to the Lord for me that nothing you have said may happen to me. What I want you to see is this. Simon doesn't repent, and Simon doesn't pray. What does he say? You pray for me. I don't want anything bad to happen to me. But he does not change. It doesn't seem that he changes his behavior or his heart or his attitude, right? Now, before we all point a finger and say, yeah, that's Simon. He's really bad. May I say to you that we Christians can do something that's very, very similar. We can hold on to things in our lives that bring condemnation, that bring bondage in our lives. Really, it brings bondage into our lives and we want to be free and we want to be released from the bondage and we want to feel better and we don't want to feel guilty and we don't want to feel condemned and we don't want to feel convicted but we don't want to repent either, do we? We don't want to repent and we don't want to change and walk in a different direction. Let me tell you something, brothers and sisters. God, the Holy Spirit, does not set us free that we might continue down a path of bondage and sin and wrongdoing because that path leads to hell. It leads to hell. God, the Holy Spirit, sets us free that we might be free indeed. That we might live the life He's called us to live. That we might enjoy the freedom that Christ won on Calvary when He was bound. That we might be free. When He was beaten, that we might be whole. When He was condemned, that we might enjoy and bask in the smile of God's love and pleasure and grace and blessing poured upon our lives. That is why Jesus came for salvation to set us free, to set us free. He whom the Son sets free is free indeed. And if you are not free indeed this morning, then you get together with God. We're going to pray at the end. We're coming, we're coming to a close in about three minutes. You ask, you do what you have to do to get free. Now, you can't, get, sometimes we can't get ourselves free because we're in bondage. Once you're in bondage, you can't get yourself free, can you? So what can you do? We repent and we change the direction and we pray and say, God, I'm sorry, you set me free. And then God the Spirit does what only He can do. You have to do what only you can do. God won't make you repent. God won't make you change direction. God won't make you stop sinning. We do that. He sets us free. He sets us free. He forgives us and He sets us free. Now let's close with this and then we're going to pray. Here's the ending and I love this ending. And I don't want you to take it the wrong way. I love on this Palm Sunday that we end with this passage. Because Peter and John and maybe Philip, we don't know, but pr I think probably not as we'll find out. Peter and John go back to Jerusalem and as they go they're preaching the gospel in all of these Samaritan cities as they go. And you know what I love about that? I love that it took not a big pastor, not a big church leader, but it seems that it was the ministry and the testimony of Philip, a servant in the church who was full of the Spirit, who started proclaiming the Christ to this group of Samaritans to break a barrier that John and Peter had not yet broken through themselves. What a beautiful picture of the Holy Spirit in His church. Now God gives pastors, teachers, evangelists, prophets, all of these for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry. That is true. 
But God, the Holy Spirit, is in charge. And when we are full of the Holy Spirit, you don't have to, oh, it's the big pastors. It's the big leaders. It's those. They will show us what to do. They will tell us where to go. They will organize. There may be some of that. There is part of that in the church, just as there will be this afternoon, in the right way. But you heard what's going to happen this afternoon. We're going to meet together, and we're going to share and discuss together because we know God gives insight and understanding and direction to all of us who are His children and who have a heart to follow Him. And it's Philip, just like all of you, that preaches the gospel. And then, after them, after him, Peter and John preaching the gospel. Praise the Lord. That's a great ending to this passage, isn't it? It really is. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, which is what Peter and John do as they go through all those Samaritan cities on their way back to Jerusalem. But we're going to close with prayer this morning. I'm going to ask you, you've been seated for, seated for a while, and some of you may be a little bit sleepy. But since you're all adults, you don't have to stand if you don't want to. But I'm going to ask you to stand. How about that? Those, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Now you feel guilty, right? <laughs> Let me put it this way. If you will, let's stand. And, and I know I just joked, but I, I'm really serious about this. Don't start talking. Shh, 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 shh. Wait. Let's talk to God first, okay? Let's, let's close by talking to God, yeah? Let's, I, I really mean that. I really mean that. And I'm not trying to make it a woo or whatever, but I really, God the Holy Spirit spoke to me this week as I was preparing that He wants us to be free also. He wants us to be free. This is the message of Palm Sunday, I think. And this is the work of Jesus when He came. He said, this is fulfilled. So what Jesus will do in setting us free is already available for us. It doesn't have to be one. It's here. It's here. And it will be worked out in our lives and our hearts through the ministry of the Spirit as we come to Him in obedience. It may be a big bondage in your life. It may be a small bondage in your life. It may be something that is really small, but you already know it is growing in your life and it's gaining control and you don't want it to go any further. This morning is the morning that the Holy Spirit will set you free if you will repent and pray and say, God, forgive me. I don't want to go this way anymore. I'm going to go in another direction. Holy Spirit, break the bondage. Holy Spirit, break the bondage that I have brought myself into by my attitudes or actions, by my belief, by my stubbornness, by my unforgiveness, by the grudges that I've been holding on to and not wanting to let go of. Oh, Jesus, this morning, you have come to set us free, to, to release the captive, to announce the year of the Lord's favor. Holy Spirit, make this true in our lives this morning as we come to you in obedience, in repentance, in prayer, in doing what we need to do, that you might do what only you can do. Holy Spirit, some of us are deceived and we don't even know we're deceived because that's the way deception works. Would you open our eyes this morning, Spirit of Truth. I pray for the church this morning. I pray for each one of us. Holy Spirit, for every willing heart, for every willing heart who has been deceived, I pray, Holy Spirit, that you will bring revelation of truth to hearts and to lives this morning of what the enemy has been lying to them about and, and leading them in a way that is away from you. Bring truth. Speak truth. Help us to come again to your word. Receive your word. Do your word in our lives by the power of your spirit. May we be free in you, for you have made us for freedom. You have won our freedom. And your power is greater. Your power is greater. Oh, Spirit, work your power in our lives for your purposes. This day we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Amen.